actually, I started debate as a middle schooler in Pittsburgh. Um, you know, just really fundamental kind of, here is a premise, here is a rebuttal, come to a conclusion. Uh, then I went to high school and I participated in the National Forensic League and the Catholic Forensic League. Uh, I stayed with Lincoln-Douglas debate. That's one-on-one -on -one as opposed to two-person policy debate um, for two reasons. Number one, I speak pretty slowly. This is about as quickly as I will ever speak unless I'm swearing at you, but whatever. Um, and the policy debaters do the thing called speed, which is just like what it sounds. You try and get as many points in as little amount of time as possible, and you deluge your opponents with facts and points so that they can't uh, keep up with you. They can't respond to everything in the time they're allotted. It's a tactic. It's a good one, and if you're fast, and you know, if I had practiced at getting fast, I probably could have done quite well at it. However, I also went to a school where I was the lone student who would have done policy debate, so uh, it's kind of hard to be on a two-person team with one person. So I stuck to Lincoln Douglas, and um, I was good. Um, I, I thrived at parliamentary debate, which was three minutes, and you can stand open to cross-examination from a panel of all of your 15 senators or Congress people. And um, you can do little parliamentary tricks like yielding your time to the person who they won't call on. And, it, and it, it's, it's a bunch of fun. So I learned technique, and I learned tactic, and then when I went to college for the first two years I studied argumentation. I've done a couple very poorly attended debates um, arguing the question of the legitimacy and the uh, efficacy of the black church, but never the God question. And um, frankly it's a shame because if if you know any women, we're good at arguing, and unfortunately there are so few of us who put ourselves out to want to uh, get involved in formal debates. There's a lot of us train and are good at it. I, it, it makes me sad that I don't see more of us actually doing it in this realm. The formal debate teaches you how to structure your argument. Here is my premise, here is my first opening thing. I will give supporting evidence to show that my premise is right. Well, if you agree with these points, then the conclusion of this first argument is this. You can't disagree with me, I've got you on these points. And then the finer, the finer arguments of, well, hold on, I, I challenge your source, um, I challenge this, that, the other, um, that translates really well into, into everyday debate, uh, everyday conversations, if you will. Um, Mom, where did you hear that? Um, well, wait a minute, isn't that an organization that's paid to say that drinking oil late in water is good? Um, how, how credible a source is that? Um, rule number one of every formal debate that I wish more people would use informally is come to terms with your terms. Um, figure out your definitions and agree or disagree. Because if I use the term, let's, let's go right to the heart of it. If I say feminist, what do I mean? You should ask me, well, what do you mean by that? If somebody says, well, you're a, you're a feminist and blah, 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 you say, hold on, I want you to define that term. That's number one. We need to make sure that when we're talking to somebody, we're, we're talking to the person and not over or under. Define your terms. Everybody should be asking for that. Everyone should be asking, uh, quote your source, cite your source, uh, tell me more. I've, I've never heard of the, well, I just pulled this out of my butt think tank. Who, who are they precisely? Um, who, who funds them? Those are actual fine legitimate questions to ask. In a formal debate where there's somebody sitting there with a stopwatch timing you who will ding you for points if you go over, um, when you have somebody keeping track of all of the points that you make and saying, okay, well, um, even though you were a better speaker and even though everything you said made sense, you got overwhelmed with the number of points the other team made that you didn't even address, so they win because you were outscored. Um, that doesn't happen 
gratefully, thankfully for our slow speakers and everyday conversation. So that doesn't translate so well. But when you can really learn how to come up with an idea and how to refute it, um, you do well. The one thing that separates a good debater from a supremely great debater is who can argue the other side better? Um, you, anytime I go into most things, it, it's, it's a training that stuck with me, um, other than do I love my husband, um, most questions, I'm going to try and tear down everything I actually believe. I'm going to try and argue the other side and see what's left standing. Um, it, it doesn't work for is this blue shirt better than that red shirt, but you know, um, which, which insurance plan should we get? This is the one I like. Let's look at all the negatives. Can save you money if you do that. Um, and then it's also very good at Thanksgiving dinner when you say to your brother-in-law who's making no sense at all, so if I see it the way you're saying it, and then lay out his case for him, sometimes that's enough to show somebody they're making no sense. There are two of them, and I'm going to cheat and go to the evolution one first. I will quote Steve Harvey. Why they still monkeys? Yeah, um, I'm trying not to swear because that, that one, that one makes me sick. It's, it's not, you know, over millions of years, slight changes. Why are there still monkeys? Get the... That one, that one's it. Okay, but the God question, well, what if you're wrong? It's like, well, we're both going to be dead at the end of it. What if I am wrong? If, if God is, is going to cast me into a pit of fire for all eternity because I dared to use the brain he gave me, as per your argument, um, then what kind of God really is he? He gave me a great brain. I use it as best I'm capable, and he's going to burn me in eternity while you're up on some cloud laughing, listening to harp music. Um, is that the God you really want to serve? Then they get mad at me for being rude, and I don't see why. The thing is, you have to understand, theists are only dealing in the realm of the unknown. Okay, so when you're dealing with somebody who wants to quote scripture at you and back and forth with you on theology, um, there are points which, you know, if I'm arguing with someone who is Muslim or someone who is, you know, arguing from a Mormon or Orthodox Jewish point of view, those are theologies that I, I have a bit of facility with, but not deep understanding. Um, I will eat apart a Catholic. Yeah, that, that, going in for the kill feels, I can think of one thing that feels better than that, but only one thing. Um, going in for the kill to, to lay waste to the idiocy spewing from someone is an amazing feeling. However, you have to consider that in most arenas, it's going to make you lose your audience. You know, an atheist going into a debate already is despised by at least a portion of that audience. Um, and even if they're a small portion, boy, can they be vocal. Um, so, the gleeful takedown of which I have been so guilty in my life, um, really doesn't serve to help your case. It's not, it, most of us do debate such as the God question or whatnot, not to say, I'm right, I'm smarter than you, you're dumb, go away. Um, we're talking to the people who are undecided. We're talking to the people who are like us but don't know that there are other folks who think that way. Um, and, and we're also planting a seed of doubt, I hope, in the children of our opponents. 
the trick that I have had to learn, you can never stop listening. You, if, if you, if, I'm really ADD, but I get into a mode where I am processing every single word and making sure that I'm listening to everything, barring something in the audience that, you know, physically turns my head. Um, because when you stop listening, you, you've, you've not served yourself. It's, it's just, why would you do that? Never stop listening, but what you want to be listening for is when you do get that point of agreement, when that broken clock is right, then you get to come out and say, look, okay, my opponent has told you that God lives on a planet, and if you blow up innocent people, you're going to get 72 virgins, and that Led Zeppelin was a crap band. He just said, however, that at this moment it's 4.15. And that's correct. Which gives me hope that my opponent actually can deal in the realm of fact. Let's talk about what's factual, and then you take down what he said. He told you this, he told you that, you know. But he did say it was 4.15. It is 4.15. Well, at least it was a minute ago when he said that. Um, it's 4.15. So, um this person who understands the way time works, it's not going to be a big deal to get him to understand the way geography works. So when we say there's a planet and it's called Kolob, uh, he can show it to us because he understands geography, time, place, they're kind of related, sort of. I have hope for him that he can do that. Um, he still hasn't showed me Kolob. Um, let's go on. Um, virgins, they do exist. You could probably find 72 in one place. My kid's in an elementary school. I bet I could round up that many. Um, not for the purposes that he wants them. But, you know, there, there are, he's, he's dealing with fact in some way. Perhaps my opponent will actually come completely to the side of fact where I am. There are times where I do believe the goal is to shut down, to shut up, to lay waste, to, you know, if somebody, you know, it, it happens a lot. Somebody will say something along the lines that you find reprehensible. It, it doesn't always have to be a blatantly racist thing or a blatantly sexist thing or um, something. Those are the easy ones where you just want to shut it down and whatever. Um, but... If you care to maintain a relationship with your brother-in-law, and you might not wish to, you know, but if you do, um, then your goal does have to be different. Your goal has to be listening for a, per, for a potential point of understanding. Um, you are my opponent. I want to make you, in theory, I want to kill every argument you come up with. I want to make your point of view die. I want to see you writhe and squirm and gently meet my eyes and and mousily whisper, you're right. I concede. Um, and, and, and that means that I have to be willing to go there. I, I'm not going to pull a punch when I debate. I don't have, and, and there are ways to do that without being mean or and and you you would never it just it just doesn't come up and i just i i just i i i like being a i'm somebody who actually likes conflict and combat i'm not happy unless there is confusion going on and the late great i will actually call him prophet patrice o'neill said it best on his posthumous release mr p check it out um, you know, there are some women who aren't happy unless there's some kind of confusion going on. I am one such woman, and debate is my, is my weapon of choice. The thing that formal debate does that around the coffee table or across the Thanksgiving table, um, or solstice table, if you will, um, that, that doesn't happen is, you know, in a formal debate, 
you nearly never hear an ad hominem. You never hear a you poopy head. Um, you just it, it's it, it's really considered beneath you to do, and it's and it's and it's you falling on your sword out of sheer embarrassment to do that. Whereas we know that you know you meathead gets thrown about almost as a badge of pride and and a lot of informal across the across the table debates. When you are really debating somebody who has matched well with you and who is is scoring points on you and is getting the crowd to react favorably to them, not out of sheer um, theatrics or rhetorical technique, because that that's something, I mean, if you've ever debated a Southern preacher, you know, when they lean back and go, well, I'm going to tell you, I used, you know, you're like, well, I can't compete with you calling the audience so that they respond. When you go to that cadence that's a call and response, you win on, re you win on rhetoric. I can win on, you know, I can win on logic or reason, but, um, when you're matched with somebody who's not doing that, where it's like you make a point, they oh I um uh I I'm gonna go to something else because I need time to think about what you said on this one for a minute. Um, it it is blood sport at its finest. It is it is pugilism of the brain, and it feels great. And there are times where I've come out of debates just as whipped as if I've come out of a of an interval training session at the gym um, and and I love I love that where I'm like oh why didn't I say eh, of course you hate it in the moment but that literal mind combat is a great thing and it's too bad that we don't encourage more female people to do it. I wish we did. It's great. I love it and I would love to be able to do that with some sisters. That'd be awesome. There are a couple reasons for that. Number one, um, formal debate is overwhelmingly a male sport. Um, you go into the high schools, you go into the colleges, there are a whole lot of girls who do debate and women who do debate. However, they are outnumbered by dudes who debate. Um, when you go into the speech events, it's much more 50-50. Some, you know, some speech competitive events you see far more women and girls doing. Um, I think in part that's cultural. I think Oh man, I would love to debate Phyllis Schlafly. Schlafly. Oh, I messed up her name. I'm sorry. Um, because she, it wouldn't just be the God question. It would be God as presented in the lives of American women. So we could go feminism. We could go, um, you know, culture. We could we could do a whole lot. I would oh and and I would love that with her because she's still alive and I could do it. Um dead on the God question, I would love uh, this is boring maybe, but I I'd like to get up in there with some C. S. Lewis because <sighs> for somebody who wrote so well and thought so deeply, I know that there was doubt in him. His questions were too good. It wasn't just do this and, you know, think this way and don't ever. There, this is somebody who I know the, the, the thought had to pass before him. Um, there were contemporaries who lived at the time he did who were, um, I guess, you know, make this whole new atheist thing possible. There were there were doubters and arguers then. Um, I think that would be, that would really be a big stretch for me to talk to somebody who uh, thought deeply, wrote a lot, and also did fiction. That would be fun. So engaging with a religious relative um, serves a number a number of goals actually. Formal debates, the goal is to win. I mean, I'm sure there's probably another goal. I haven't thought of it. I, I'm 
open to persuasion. I argue to the children of my opponent. Now, if that's my uncle who makes everybody call him bishop because he said God called him to be a bishop, uh, you know, so if I'm arguing with, you know, Knight takes bishop uncle, um, I'm not as interested in changing his mind. I'm interested in making my younger cousins and my own child and people who are wrestling with the questions and who haven't had 60 plus years of identity in this particular worldview. Um, so arguing with, with my uncle, Knight Takes Bishop uncle, um, I want the people who overhear us to realize he really doesn't have any reason for this. Everything comes down to, well, you just got to believe. Well, you just got to believe. Well, you just got to believe. Hey, I love Cher as much as the next person, but believe gets old, okay? Personally, I get really frustrated with that one. When somebody comes down to, well, you just gotta believe and have faith and I, la la la, personally, and how do you explain the tide rolling in and out? Um, the truth conversation, to me, provides too many escape routes for my opponent. Because the known truth and the unknown truth can go on, and has gone on, um, since humans looked around and said, where am I? Um, nobody reads Plato anymore, so you can't even with a lot of people at a coffee table, or there, is there a coffee table? Across the table, having coffee. You can't even go to Allegory of the, uh, Allegory of the Cave with a lot of people. Some you can, most I find I can't. Oh wait, isn't there a commandment about that? I can't remember. I'm a godless heathen. I don't know your book better than you do. But if I did, I would point you to all the uh, inconsistencies in your own life. You speak in front of men. Your head is uncovered. Um, your braids look better than mine. You're not supposed to do that. Um, I'm just saying, Auntie Sue, you know, you want me to live by the Bible, and I'm asking you who does live by the Bible why all the stuff you're doing is unbiblical. And that's a lovely poly cotton blend. Ooh, I wish I could wear cut that color, too. Um, they, they, people get a, you know, um, oh, yes, yes, you live, you live according to the Bible, huh? Uh, you're menstruating, and uh, you sat in the same chair your husband sat in. Ooh, he's unclean, and so are you. You're unclean. Shouldn't you burn that chair now? Oh, you don't do that. You make the best shrimp of anybody I know. And your book says you're not supposed to do that. Why, why are you being hypocritical there, you know? Man ought not lie with man. Well, you know, <laughs> divorce was also something that your book said wasn't possible and frankly you're fornicating and should be stoned. When was the, when's the last time you stoned somebody you know who's doing somebody they shouldn't be doing? You know. So you don't live a biblical life, Auntie Sue. You just I mean that's what you're saying. But that's not what you're doing. Why are you not doing what you say you're doing? So God comes down, I'm Shiva, um, and I ask my girlfriend, would you then reject Jesus and worship Shiva and become Hindu. And she said no, because that's just, I, I believe in Jesus, I love Jesus, I worship Jesus, I am washed in the blood of the Lamb, and then she went on. Um, and so, what is, what is truth in that instance? What I like to do is I like to pin down, okay, let's define your God. Which God? Are we talking Poseidon or are we talking Kali? That's my personal favorite. I love Goddess Kali. She has such a great story as hers. I mean, she wears a girdle of the severed hands of her slain foes. She wears a necklace of the heads um, that she's ripped off of. I mean, how do you not want to worship that? I think that's awesome. Go Kali. Um, but when I'm talking to somebody, 
and it's like, well, you just got to have faith. Okay, who do you have faith in? Poseidon or uh, Shiva or Kali? Which one? Oh, oh, no, 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 the one true God. Oh, Baal? Oh, wow, we're, we're taking it back, aren't we? Baal pre-existed. No, 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 the I am who has been and who always will be. I'm like, okay, uh, give me a name. God, no, give me a name. A lot of people actually can't name the God they worship. Of course, some will say Yahweh, you know, or, or the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, or Spirit, or whatever. Um, and, I, and, and I go, okay, so, um, uh, you know, how do you know it is this God? How do you know you're not being misled by another God? You know, who, and, and if we're going to go down a rabbit hole, I, I want to be driving the rabbit hole excursion tour bus. Um, I want to ask absurd questions that, you know, okay, let's let's define your God. Let's pin him, her, it, they down. Let's figure out who it is you mean, what it is you mean. And then it's fun because then you start getting the no true Scotsman, you know. Well, um, you know, wait, your God said he was evil. He All things flow from him. He's good. He's evil, right? So he's evil. Is he the devil? No? Why not? Well, evil comes from... Explain, wait, I'm confused. Wait, who's your God again? Um, arguing with theists, um, I like to do it, but I like to do it about things that are concrete. I like to talk about um, questions of why, why are the most religious people the most disenfranchised around the world? Let's just talk about that here in the U.S. Um, let's talk about um, why it is that uh, the question of theodicy, why is there evil? Why do good, or forgive me, why do bad things happen to good people? Um, I, the, the, oh, the hand wringing, and, and, and you, you see more gymnastics there than you do at the Olympics. Um, well, maybe somebody did bad in a former life. Oh, you're Hindu. No, no, no. I'm a Christian. I'm a good Christian. Somebody in a for so wait. You're talking about past lives. Are we talking? Wait, what? Where'd that come from? Well, maybe they're being punished for their for their ancestors. Oh, oh, huh. Punishment today of ancestral misbehavior. Let's talk about that. Pick a country. Oh, or, or we could just stay in America. What ramification does that have? Your God does that. Wait. But isn't there a visit not the sins of the Father? You know, but people, people who believe and who don't want to learn to think differently, they're easy. They're, because you're, it, you just go back and forth in the same ways and you get frustrated. When their kids are listening, oh, that's when... Um, it's really fun to argue because the it, it is the nature of a young mind that's developing and growing to want to combat that which is programmed into it. So giving the, the kids ammunition, um, showing the person doesn't really know everything they claim to know, saying things like, you know, this religion is just a way to control your daughter's sexuality, isn't it? You just don't want your daughters having sex ever, period. Isn't that what this is all about? And then they get mad. And I'm like, no, I'm just asking because I don't know. I, you know, I'm a, I'm a godless heathen, and I know not the ways of you godly people. So you got to teach me. Debates are the most important way to communicate from the minority point of view. You know, so I just, I just, life is short. I like to laugh a lot and religious adherence gives me a lot to laugh about.